Hey, hey, people. You're Yuri here. So, this is the one I'm really nervous about. This is the part of the God's Light Gospel called An Ordinary Testament. And this is where I talk about why I'm convinced that God is real. And, you know, this is a tough thing to get into talking about. But, uh, you know, I'll see you on, on the other side of the, the stuff. And then we'll talk. So this is called an ordinary testament, and it's very personal, I'm very shy about it. That's why I feel the need to, to, to do it as a video. So facts matter. That's what we forget all the time. It's just how much facts matter. It's it's pretty much the only thing that matters is the facts, right? But the question is whether matter itself is made of facts or are facts made of matter. And this might seem like an inane question, just a brain teaser that's that's there just to mess with you, but it's not. Really think about it. What matters more, facts or matter? Which came first? Well, I've never tried to stuff a chicken back into an egg. <sighs> What do I mean by any of this? And what is matter? Really, what is it? What is matter? What is matter? Where does it come from? I've been told by my therapist that when I ask a, a question while journaling, I should answer it immediately. But all of existence would be the answer. And in truth, how can I ever give even a piece of that? I do not know. I do not know. I do not know. But Lord, help me. I do know that believing a thing can make it true, even when it does not make it so. I can say this confidently, because I have read the Gospel of John, the New Living Translation. I can say this confidently because it was given to me by a meth addict. I can say it confidently because... I was living on the streets of Portland too. And I didn't get to actually read the book, this woman, like this, this woman whom I'd seen around in the streets while I was living in the streets, like this woman, she came walking up to me with this book and it was the gospel of John, New Living Translation. And I, I read it and tears came out of my eyes the way they do when I talk about my grandparents' lives in World War II. This well of water, like what must have been in Jesus before Longinus spit him with his spear. I mean, John 3.16, enter with belief that there is a maker to this whole mess, that there is some consciousness ultimately responsible. And this isn't nom. There are rules, and those rules were unbending. But read this without irony. That which formed all of us loves us so much that he came into the world in order that he could more than understand us, experience us, know us. He already understood, but to know us, he had to come here and he did no wrong. Only tried to help in every way he could. And they shamed and beat and criminalized and tortured him to death for it so that all could see him die see him die like a puddle of water to elude his strength into weakness such are the laws of man and somehow this experience let that which we'll call god forgive us everything we've ever done this let god wipe clean the slates. I would not say that there is no emotion, but I cannot encompass what I feel. I am numb to the depth of the abiding pain and confusion. Dumb. The question why hanging unasked like Christ over the pit. Why? If this story that so, so, so 
many born into this world have sworn by, have claimed to have righted broken lives by, have, have died insisting that they were true, have died with love for their killers. If this story were true, then why? If it were true in the first place, why Why the whole thing? If there were a God, then why this? Why? If there were a God, there's some basic good creator. Why are we so prone? Why are we so prone to a lazy dullness, to a hopeless walk down a long tunnel with fireworks all around us, distracting us, and something like a black hole at the end where we'll never look? Why? How could the creator be good and yet his creations? The creations are capable of such mendacity and cruelty. How come I have never seen a miracle while sober? Why did they come to my father's father's home? By what right? Why was he not allowed to keep his teddy bear? Or was it his favorite pillow? A five-year-old on the street with nowhere to go but to follow his own bewildered parents once middle-class landowners, farm, doing okay, self-sufficient, and then suddenly, overnight, cool locks with privilege that needs to be righted, all through the power of belief. The facts around ownership suddenly became stuffed into an egg and painted, then covered with wax, and dipped in dyes, and painted again. My mother's father was born in Poland, but he was Ukrainian too. Belief changed his home from one country to another overnight. Belief brought the Blitzkrieg. Belief brought the commies. Somehow the whole thing has a Russian twist, but who really hatched that egg? Who sat on the generations of abuse of rightless Christian people? martyring their ways through their days who warmed this beast to hatching belief makes truth or truth makes belief but either way chickens are for eating and stalin made stalin made eating a rebellious act it was illegal to eat for years have you heard of the holodomor it's like the holocaust but more impersonal if a child was found with food i could never remember was it him or his father who had his tongue removed? But anyway, people ate babies as though they were chickens. I don't feel it as I cry pondering this. So I lived in a city called Yangsan for a number of years in South Korea. And I was a teacher there. And when I was teaching in Yangsan, South Korea, which you can distinguish from North Korea by belief and aligned landmines, I cried in front of the class. You know, not crying now, but that's what happened then as I was crying in front of the class. What happened is I had just started my new job after wandering through the world of the dead in Australia. You might ask how you get to the world of the dead. But first I should tell you about my student. He was around 12. There's a certain breed of young man that you encounter in Korea that I've not really seen anywhere else. It reminds me of the first meeting of the Pope with the tribe of the angels. <laughs> Sorry, the angles. And the Pope said that they should be called angels. But he, like so many papists, papists, papists was distracted by colors and textures. I've met maybe three Korean young men who have this distinctive geometry to the light that shines from them, as light shines from everyone. A quality of genuineness, a purity in the eyes and skin that is just particular in its branding. And the more I, I, I go over it, talking about how beautiful this kid was, the more it's like I worry about people perceiving me like I'm one of those priests or something that are so famous these days. And it's like, it's so weird to always have that in the back of your head, like to be worried about people assuming things about you that aren't at all true. 
And wouldn't it be wonderful to just not have that anxiety anymore? But somehow in, in this age, in this life that I find myself in, affection and sexuality have gotten entangled, at least in the minds of those who grew up watching TV and soaking in the zeitgeist, this subtle twisting of admiration. But anyway, he was a beautiful kid. And he came into my room with a bunch of other kids at lunch, and they were asking me about myself, Yuri, is that Russian? And I may have explained that this was like if I were to ask him if he were Japanese, if he'd asked me if I were Polish, which no one ever does, I would say that was like being called Chinese. I don't know if my parallelism holds up outside my own head. The nice thing about being the only foreign teacher in a school is that it doesn't matter. I get to give the gospel of Yuri the American however I please. And it's true because it's true to me. In any case, I told him how my grandfather had been a little older than him and a little younger than me when the Second World War started. The war that to this day has his people shooting missiles across a line that is there because they believe it is there. The longest standing injustice of many from that time carried over because we believe it has to be. I told him how my grandfather had been the son of a fisherman. How when the war started, Ukraine made its own army. This was around the time that Putin stole Crimea, when I was telling him. But what I was telling him about was when Ukraine lost its short-lived nationhood. In America, I grew up hearing about the evils of the Nazis, the death camps, but they were not the ones who decided their beliefs about who owned our homes who preceded all that came before. My grandfather was conscripted, and Soviet propaganda calls them fascists. All I know is that my grandfather wrote, and I haven't read much of that. It was hard to read his journal. In class that week, the boy asked about my family, and I started explaining, but the tears, you know, I don't really control them, nor do I really feel them, except as a sort of a faint pleasure. The boy, though, he wept like a Nick Cave song. He had to leave the classroom as I continued to describe what had happened. He apologized for weeks. Me, <laughs> I enjoy crying. That's why I do any of this. So I can cry. And what had happened? A change in beliefs. It was as simple as that. The beliefs changed. Suddenly it was okay to make boys kill other boys. Suddenly it was okay to take whatever you wanted. Even if it was a person. A mother. A sister. A cousin. A woman. An object. Suddenly, people believed that other people were objects. Is that not what we've always been subject to? Changes in the rules that we did not make? So this next part is called The Scarlet Lady. It's the most uncomfortable part of the whole thing. Because, well, I mean, you can probably start guessing already why. It's because I was in love with a woman once, I thought. The first time I lost my temper with her, she had me thrown in jail. And then she kept a trial hanging over my head for six months. Some of which I was homeless for. And then she insisted on coming to the trial to make sure that I wouldn't be free from the whole thing for three years. Three years. Meanwhile, she was free. She had always been free. First class Chinese, you see. And I wonder if anyone is people to anyone, especially from that leisure class that has no worries yet worries everything. They're the ones with the right to set the beliefs that make the lines. Like the borders drawn in the Middle East that have Iran and Saudi Arabia dropping bombs on Yemen over and over and over again as though they had come to consider themselves a fair replacement for the weather. But I can't help but see her as the one piloting those drones and drawing out the lines. The belief that it is okay to hurt another is something twisted, and yet it persists. I wonder if Jesus ever made it down to Yemen. If he had, the infrastructure was better then than our ruling class has left it. And what can we do? After I had the breakdown that 
led to my failing out of Chinese medicine school, I worked to raise money for Save the Children. They're in over 120 countries and a century old, but I'd never heard of them before I had to get a job instead of living off of loans and just never quite managing to be a scholar. I could hear, uh, I could heal people. I could heal people. That's why I came to school. But I've been circling around, and this is supposed to be a gospel. But again, I have to ask, which came first, the story or the writer? John only mentions himself briefly, very briefly, in third person, as a disciple whom Jesus loved. That was humble. But that gospel has been written, and meeting Christ in the flesh now is meeting one at, oneself at one's truest. And for that, you have to know why you're crying in front of students when you talk about your family history. And for that, you have to forgive. But what does that even mean? What does it mean to forgive? I'm sorry. Oh, that's all right. But really, that's a ritual and such things are empty, like bowing to King Jong-il statues or kissing the Pope's ring or letting a mass murderer like Mao Zedong have his picture hang over the forbidden city. Or when you exchange I love you's with a spouse, you no longer even really see as anything but an appendage to your life. Where is your heart in this? And what is the heart? Is it imaginary or do you feel it? When you say your heart breaks, what does that mean? And what about when it opens? Oh. This is the gospel of Christ. When the heart opens, it's like an egg, you know, your heart and heart and the shell around it. If there were a pill to hatch it, we'd all have wings. We'd fly through deserts on streams of water. But there is no pill, and that's why God works us over like he does. I tell you truly, that's why we suffer. That's why we long to suffer why we douse it out subconsciously, anything to shake the heart, anything to crack that shell. That's why we never stop searching, like Leonard Cohen for David's secret chord. We want to say it, constantly from the heart, like it's the beat of it. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. That's why we love what the aim to lose, because we know in the heart, beneath our hearts, that the only, the only way we can get it to hatch is by breaking it open. I promised so many times. I was promised so many times. There were so many promises of a heart of flesh for my heart of stone, but I don't even know what a heart is. So how would I know if anything was even happening? How was anyone to know what will do it? What will make that permanent change? And that, that is why I went to the Scarlet Lady, the Chinese nymph, that landed siren, the one who made me a criminal. So angry that all the sacrifices, all the offerings were treated as nothing when she weighed them against her breath and her empty breasts. And I know that is not fair. When it comes to it, she really, she gave me so much. She was pretty loaded. She gave me so much. And yet without her, how would I ever have truly heard Leonard, when he said, I did my best, and it wasn't much. I couldn't feel, so I tried to touch. Without her, I would not know how, when I stand before the Lord of Song, to empty my tongue of everything but hallelujah. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if the exaltation comes from heaven or hell. If you climb a mountain to scream it or moan it from the belly of the whale, it must come out, the fullness of everything you've ever felt in every moment. Hallelujah. And when it comes to it, that's the only word worth saying. The only one with true meaning. From everything you have. From everything you have. From everything you have as you look over the graves of your ancestors. As you finally give up on your lover to find your love. Hallelujah. That's the gospel of Christ. Hallelujah. 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 Her nose is bleeding when I met her. 
This is a strange thing about me, and I do not know if anyone else has this strangeness, but mine used to bleed too, until I had it cauterized. What's strange is the amount of meaning I find in that, and in the pictures on packs of cigarettes. Perhaps this was a stumbling block, but if I'm honest, it only really comes out when I'm in a manic cycle. She sat next to me. I was the teacher's assistant in a massage class my last semester as a student before the spirits took me, or insanity, because we all have to admit we'll never know. We can never know for certain if we are just having ourselves on. She sat beside me in shiatsu, and I had come to Chinese medicine because I did yoga, and I did yoga, so I went to Thailand to study massage in the first place. And there I met a man at my hotel from Australia who had been practicing massage for years. He taught me that if you find a point to hold, if you just find the point, then the whole system of organs could unravel if you just hold the point and follow it. It is something that we don't categorize in the senses, a touch with color, a sight with sound, that vibration of whatever it is that fills us. I closed my eyes and saw him, lines of light. I had been sober for two years at that point, a prostitute I had befriended platonically in the hotel looked at us askance, and I worked points on his wrists for him. Uh, as I so yeah, it was this weird thing where I was like I was like just doing massage for the guy, and she gave this the woman like she was a prostitute. She was a nice girl, like you know. Um, but she gave us the funniest look, like I was like some lascivious look, like like I was talking about earlier in this whole piece about implying that you know any kind of affection is sexual that's it's just it's it's a demonic thing and it's it's a construct that we don't have to honor but in any case um the man his name was tarpan and he had been a follower of osho's um and so is actually because of osho he was friends with another guy named vardan who actually passed away recently, um, you know, and I, 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 was, I was doing some work for him as well. I, I miss the guy already, but he, he's a good man. Um, in any case, so Vardan saved my life. Well, I mean, maybe not a little, maybe, who knows? I mean, I was, I was getting pretty wild in Thailand. And Vardan let me, like, you know, come to his place after I got out of the hospital and stuff and just, like, he didn't exactly take care of me. He just like he he looked out looked out for me, and it's just interesting the way that all of these things interconnect with each other. the The reason that Tarpan had introduced me to Vardan was because his wife was Korean and I was living in Korea at the time. And any case, in any case, by any road, what details did John leave out? Could Jesus have gotten the chicken back into the shell? He wouldn't have. The Prince of Peach, he hatches hearts, and to reverse the order just isn't in him. The smoke does not go back into the cigarette, and I do not render unto Caesar. And therefore, I may always be a criminal. I broke God's law with her. She was married, and I told myself the fact that she was already cheating. It does make it better, right? Does it make it better that the marriage was already broken? That that was some excuse for trespassing? I don't know, but something happened when our eyes met. She said we shared shun, the Chinese word for spirit, and I confused, well, I must have confused baptism for marriage. The Scarlet Lady fooled me by fooling herself. But there's so many characters and details. Who made Jesus smile the brightest? It is not written. I testify to this Bible. Now, I'm not sure why I called this chapter this, but that's what it's called. We made out on the stairs at the home she'd shared with her husband, desperate for whatever it was we felt inside of each other. Her son, five years old, came out in a panic. You have to go. I was getting my shoes on when the door started to open. The, these Doc Martens she'd had me buy because that's the first thing women always see, she said. The last purchase I'll likely ever make on my own credit card. I had to run into the garage, closing the door behind me. 
opening the garage door and running out, coming to the front of the house. She still had him on the porch and I was almost spotted. The only time I met him, she set him out to get us beer. I went with him, asking how they'd met. They'd both studied film, but really he was just her escape from her family, though she'd never tell him that. Somehow we see how they treat others, but never know. Never let ourselves know that to them will always be an other. Every time I see her at school, she always has her nose buried in her laptop. I feel for you, man. I really do, I told him. This was weeks before the Doc Martens, so I paid for the beer on my card. Your wife is cooking for me. The least I can do is buy you booze. And you can't get fidelity back into a marriage any easier than a chicken into an egg. So who made Jesus smile the brightest and what was that smile like? I met a living goddess once in Kerala, the hugging saint, Amma. Time flattens in memory, and does it matter? I don't think the angels know it the same way, and this is all built on their backs. It was my 21st birthday, and I had planned to not be at the ashram anymore then. You know, not everyone in their lifetime gets a chance to meet a sadguru, Ash said. And how can I describe this ashram? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John never wasted time on describing architecture. Saints had gathered there in the calm sand. Apartment buildings, 20 stories, white people, scrubbing pots, and Indians standing in bread lines. An old man came up to me with his disciple, his eyes almost white, his hair lighter than that, and a smile that almost spoke of its own. Stay. Stay, please. So I changed my flight. She's a fraud. Look, she claims she can make food from water. She pours instant pudding in. My mom said in a 2009 video chat. When she hugged me, my mind stopped. I wandered through her garden, everything fresh, just like, just like, just like one just born. I met my teacher, Paul, there. He taught me Qigong, the order of the cosmos, and that Christianity is evil, so much like his namesake, crosswise. I got my job in Jejudo while I was at Paul's house in London, practicing Qigong and drinking ayahuasca. I sat on the wall outside his parents' house playing the flute, and two Brits came up. You're like an angel. These drunks were blown away by the yogi on the wall making sounds out of a reed. I learned from them that there ain't no black in the Union Jack. Mark, the giant light-skinned West Indies man, hugged me and told me he'd listened to their casual racism and was terribly amused by my responses. I do not remember what I told them. I think I was just unable to comprehend the notion that color applied to people. But then... I've never been a papist. As I left the class where I met the Scarlet Lady, her nose bleeding early because I'd been in the midst of an episode of insomnia, a blonde woman came up to me. Hey, your name is Yuri. I exchanged emails with a guy named Yuri that I met in India years ago. And sure enough, I'd met Ash nine years before at Amma's house. And suddenly she was at my school. We had lunch later. She told me that the woman I sat next to was married and had a child. Is it serious? I asked. I, well, while, while I was breaking down three months later, due to whatever it is in me that has to talk to Uncle San Pedro and Aunt Silas Iben, I had the Scarlet Lady in the library massaging her where I had no right to. The next day, she came to a needling appointment of mine and saw me shirtless. She came to my house and we sweated together. We looked in each other's eyes and she said we shared shin and she'd never experienced that before. Two years later, she'd find out from her mom that her mom had cancer. On the fourth day of a bout of insomnia I was dealing with when I had realized that she'd always want money from me and I'd never have time to gather and that Chinese medicine would be an eternal uphill battle forever and that I had to leave. I had decided to go back to teaching to get a paycheck again and maybe salvage something of my finances. Little did I know she had other plans, and so did God. 
though she'd never admit intention behind it. I have found, and I hope that you'll forgive me if you disagree, that women never admit to fault. It's just something they can't do, especially where a man is involved. Somehow, the more we give them of ourselves, the more we are in their debt. It's an odd thing, but God's sense of irony cuts deeper than bone. That night she yelled at her mom in Chinese while I hid, as I always hid, because I was not someone she admitted she had helping her with her rent on her place or sharing a bed with or a relationship with. Ah, Scarlet Lady, you brought out the lighter and the joint, just your fanny covered, lit the lighter, and as I brought the joint to the flame, you ran into the hall. I chased you with a coat as you refused to come inside. You sat in the lobby and an overweight neighbor who no doubt has as much reason to hate those of us beset with the Y chromosome as all overweight ladies must, called 911. I came back in. The police came, saw that nothing was wrong, but told me to keep my distance, and I did. I took a bath, and every splash I made was a harassment that would not let her sleep. Scarlet Lady, you must know what happened, yet somehow you don't. The mind is a strange place. I started to drink so I could let you sleep, and then something strange happened. I was drunk suddenly, and you came out like a storm started pouring liquor down the drain. Then you tried to run out again, and I pulled you in, and something took me. I don't know what. I spat in your face, you say, as you had in your husband's, more metaphorically. I deserved that night in jail. The six months with a case pending so that I could not get on a lease, though, I guess that's the root of this gospel. If you want to meet God, you have to give up the idea of having a home. I will never get that chicken back into the egg. But I did start smoking a lot. Most homeless do. And they are modern lepers. I never met one who could get the smoke back into the cigarette either. How strange the truth is. Grasp at it and it gets further. Let it settle and it's just everything. Once you meet it, it's hard not to keep chasing the dragon. But usually all you end up with is its tail. This gets unlivable if you are, in fact, yourself the dragon.